Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 32nd edition of ITVA. Uh, my name is uh, Jasper Hocke, and I'm one of the short film programmers here at the festival. Uh, and as a programmer, we're not only here to showcase the best films in our programs, uh, but together with our fantastic industry team, we'll also try to create opportunities for uh, the filmmakers to meet industry professionals and uh, decision makers. So I'm really glad that you're all here uh, for the If Then short, uh, Global Short Pitch, uh, which we organized together with uh, the Tribeca Film Institute and was generously supported by Riot Films. Uh, we're big fans of the Tribeca Film Institute and their different initiatives, their TFI alumni program, their TFI If Then program. Uh, and we're going to present some fantastic projects by a group of fantastic filmmakers from uh, all over the world. Uh, and before the teams will introduce themselves and their projects, uh, Chloe here is going to introduce If Then uh, and uh, our jury's, uh, jury members. So please give her a warm welcome. Welcome to the If Then Global Short Pitch Competition. Uh, we're so excited to be here. Uh, and thank you so much to our partners, Riot Films. Thank you to ITFA for hosting us. We're so happy to be here. Uh, as Jasper said, my name is Chloe Bai. I am the program director of If Then Shorts at TFI. Uh, if Then is a completion fund and mentorship program, as well as a distribution initiative for short documentaries. This program supports regional voices and community-driven stories around the globe with the goal of discovering and empowering more inclusive voices in short-form storytelling. We launched this program in January of 2017 with support from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. And we entered the short space to highlight the growing opportunities of short docs that uh, in reaching newer and wider audiences on a global playing field, and to stimulate partnerships between new funding sources and distribution partners. I see lots of amazing platforms represented in this room, and I'm so, so happy that we've been able to work with you all. Uh, to date, we've supported 25 short docs through pitch competitions at partner film festivals in the four regions of the US and two international regions, Eastern Europe and Southeast Asia. You all have some sales books on your seats and so you can see our full catalog of, uh, of shorts that we've supported. In talking with IDFA and Riot, we decided that for our 2019 global pitch, we had to focus on climate change. Um, you know, climate change is seen and felt in every region on the globe. And we believe that the documentary film community has a responsibility to highlight these issues through creative, nuanced, and emotional storytelling. I can't ignore how important it is that we're doing this pitch here at IDFA at one of the premier festivals in Europe. Um, climate change has a colonial legacy and so does Holland, and so does documentary, starting with John Flaherty. I think that if we want to practice what we preach in writing some of these wrongs and, and these colonial wrongs, we have to ask who has a right to tell a story and why we are supporting them in making it. Uh, so we're really, really happy that for this pitch, we didn't bring in filmmakers to fly in, film, and fly out. We have a group of amazing storytellers here that are providing us an insider perspective to the characters and communities that they know best. I'd now like to invite our program manager, Caitlin May Burke, to tell you more about those filmmakers and what we have in store today. Hi, everyone. With both IDFA and Riot Films, we selected what we thought were the six strongest teams and six most exciting projects, and we look forward to uh, sharing them with you in just a few minutes. We've also invited a panel of industry representatives to select one of these projects to receive the cash prize of up to US $25,000 in completion funding and the potential of a one-year wraparound distribution membership. Uh, membership, great. Mentorship. Uh, <laughs> That's literally my job, and I should probably know what I do. Uh, in addition to the grand prize winner, we'll have a guaranteed uh, secondary distribution window with Riot Films, and we're very grateful to them for that opportunity as well. Today, we're also so fortunate to offer one additional honorable mention cash prize uh, with support from the International Emerging Film Talent Association based in Monaco. Uh, TFI and IEFTA share the mission of discovering and developing film talent from emerging regions globally and connecting them to established industry professionals, which is what we're going to see today as well. 
We will announce the winner of the prizes tonight at the reception, which starts at 9.30. Uh, so come early. We'll announce it at around 9.30, but the reception starts at 9. Uh, so get a drink on us to tamper your anticipation. Um, I'd now like to go to our jury and ask them to introduce themselves briefly with their name, their uh, country, and the organization or uh, role that they're representing today. Yes. So, then I start. Um, I am Raul Nino Zambrano. I'm originally from Venezuela, but I've been living here in the Netherlands 20 years. I'm a senior programmer at ITFA, and I do the first appearance competition, Dutch competition, student competition. Yep. Hi, I'm Amy Hobby. I'm the executive director of the Tribeca Film Institute. Um, they've hidden these projects from me, so I, I have no advantage over the rest of the jury. Um, good work, guys. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm just gonna go deep. I'm uh, originally from uh, Florida, in the United States, uh, Central Florida, and um, I li now live in New York City. Hey, hi everyone. Uh, I am Judy Kibinke, and I am from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I founded and run a film fund called DocuBox, and yeah, that's it really. Glad to be here. Hi, I'm Alison Clayman. I'm a director and producer. I have two films here at it for this year. One is called The Brink. Um, in Best of Fess and The Villain, and another film called Flower Punk, which is a short um, in the Luminous category. Um, and I also just want to extend a congratulations from Haley Pappas, uh, head of Riot Films, who couldn't be here, but sh she's so proud of everything, and I'm taking pictures, and yeah, thanks for everybody's hard work. I'm Jia Zhao, uh, Chinese uh, from origin, living here also just as Rahu, since more than 20 years in this beautiful city of Amsterdam. Uh, I'm a producer, make filmmaker. Um, yeah, well, uh, being an Asian, living so long in, in, in Europe, I try to bring the resources from East and West to do something which makes sense. Very honored to be here. Great. Thank you, jury. So a quick reminder of the rules before we get started. Each pitch will be seven minutes, followed by approximately seven to eight minutes of moderated uh, conversation and constructive feedback from the jury. For the filmmakers, as you know, I'll give you a two minute and one minute warning by raising my hand and then Chloe will take it over. Uh, so let's kick things off. Uh, without further ado, uh, Poland Lee from Cambodia with Cemetery of Green Souls. Start a time yet. <laughs> <laughs> One second is so precious. Um, I just want to make sure if everybody hears me well. Yeah. Okay, because my mom's always told me that I speak so low, you know. Um, so I'm so happy to, to, to start out. Yesterday I was so nervous, but I think to, on this morning I was like more than happy. Okay, let's begin. Um, this morning, I, I, I woke up to prepare my pitch at 6.30, and I went to the park in front of my hotel, and I found a leaf. And I saw that leaf, and there was a mark of the worm eating the leaf. And you immediately find it. It, it reminded me of my childhood when I was like 10, 11 years old, when I first studied about photosynthesis and the, the, how the um, leaf breathe. And it changed my way of looking at leaf since then. I felt more sympathized with leaf. So it led me to um, two years ago when I discovered an indigenous community in Cambodia. When I was there, what I studied at school was so different because what I studied at school was just scientific. But at indigenous village, it's more spiritual. The people, they never studied about photosynthesis or anything about leaf, but they understand the nature. So I learned more through the experience between a human and nature over there. And of course, when I go back to the city, my mom said, your skin looks so better. I said, of course, because of nature, not like pollution in the city, you know, <laughs> like it's true. 
a good tip for good skin. <laughs> I'm joking. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was a bittersweet moment for me, but especially for the villager because um, in that area, over 10 kilometers square of the forest and nature, they witnessed so many pain from the, the rapid development from the countries. The special place about the special thing about the place is that on the other side of the forest land, the huge forests were killed by the reservoir of a hydroelectric dam. And on the other side of the vill village, it was all swallowed by the rubber plantations. So the village they live like an island. And sometimes I feel like those islands it's waiting for the tsunami of the rapid development that come eating them. So my story is about this indigenous group based on 50 families. They gather together to protect their forest. But my story focuses on one character, a really special woman. She is a single mother of four children. She is 35 years old. Her name is Nyung. It means little girl. So Nyung has been growing up since 35 years. And she told me that she has witnessed nothing till now, but just the change of the landscape, the loss of her land, the loss of the spirit, the loss of nature. And she said she never thought that she would end up her life living in fear like now, because she was so peaceful with her ancestors. And now she's not, she doesn't only have a fear for herself, but also a fear for the childhood and the future of her children. And it touched me in a way. And so in order, but she, one thing about her that's special that she doesn't see herself as the victim of the climate change of the development, but she see herself as the guardian that she want to, she has the, this kind of tradition that passed on by her ancestor. So she, she joined her group to, um, to protect the forest. Every time when the, the, the loggers, they came to cut down the forest, they, she just went out there and risked so many things to protect the forest. Sometimes they stop the logger, sometimes the logger show up the weapon and gun and sh like uh, threaten them that if you're going to stop me, I'm going to kill you and so on. So, you know, everybody of us, we go to work, come back home safety, knowing that our children at home, but for her, every time, every journey that she went out there with her villagers, it's all risky. She sometimes doesn't know if she came back home safe. So um, I have a piece of trailer that I'm going to show you, please. ลูกสัตว์นึงยมจังสนอหมดยีหมดตายยมน้อมยังมอพิจิตาฉะนั้นนี่ให้ดอให้ไข่ปลาเองยังให้ตะมนุษย์เดี๋ยวเราเนี่
So, um, I'm, I made this film not to represent the fight for climate change, but I believe more into love and compassion. So this film is different from other film because I think even you are politicians, you are activists, you are indigenous, you are anybody. Deep down inside, we're all just human beings. And in, all, in order to survive on this planet, we need love and compassion. And it's not only love and compassion that, that, that um, we should have among human beings, but we should also have towards nature that has been our mother since a long time ago. Thank you. Thank you, Poland. So we have a story about deforestation in Cambodia and, indigenous, and an indigenous community fighting it. Anybody from the jury want to volunteer for feedback or should I just bully you all into it? Gia? Um, <laughs> do, you, do you have any kind of comments or questions for Poland? So um, more question, I think it's a very beautifully short uh, footage. So your focus would be a little bit on this poetry uh, between the human nature. Would you also comment on what, I mean, I see people come to damage the forest. So, so you say that it's not going to be on the fight. So it will be a poetic portrait of the human and nature relationship. Would that, is that what you intended to tell? Um, this film intended, um, it's to, um, the sh to show the struggle, the solidarity of this indigenous group to fight against, but I don't want it to be a, a thing to provoke the violence between two parties. Because I have been seeing that, like, I know that activism is good, but in a way we have to not forget too that we still are human beings, we still have time to um, negotiate, and sometimes maybe some people they do not understand about the connections. That's why I want to use this film as a means to bring this, the grace of nature, the human connection, just to remind people that, hey, before you make a decision, don't forget that you are the nature, the nature is you, you know. So this film is about like that. Thank you. Hi, yeah, I, I found that very moving. Um, I think when I also look at my own country, I, you can literally just see forests thinning and and, and vanishing. Um, I wanted to ask how you, in this short film, see it developing. Would it, is it about you know a, a war that intensifies more and more between what she's trying to protect and what others are trying to take, or or will it stay in the realm of um, as you beautifully described, you know, the, the loss of nature and you know, will it be more about the confrontation or will it be more about the the poetry of loss? So um, the film is planned to be made um, uh, between um, six years, or oh, six, not six years, six months from now, and it's going to be 20 minutes films. So I think there's a lot of time um, for me um, to tell a lot, of, a lot of stories. So there will be um, the struggle between these people against the illegal loggings, but also um, the, the, the time to um, invite the audience to feel the presence of the natures and to to not learn, but to understand something. And um, my plan is to make a lot of um, uh, close up about the, the, what to say, the anatomy of the leaves, of the wood and everything, just to, let's say um, I was all, all, uh, all, a lot inspired by um, Terence Malik, because I love his way of portraying nature that he goes deeper, not only the superficial. Like I said at the beginning, it's just like the film, not only about fight, but about the love and understanding and the compassion. Hi, congratulations. Hello. Thank you. Uh, super quick question. Um, w will there be other adult characters, do you think, or will it just focus only on her and her children? So um, now I have already character. Um, the, the mother, she is the main character. But um, in the actual filming, I'm going to um, interview and follow also the life of, um, what to say in English, the partner, the colleague that they, they form the group together. Because this one thing about indigenous, whatever 
happen, they always gather together to, to discuss about things. So I want to interview like a very like old grand grandfather, like almost 90 years already. So he's going to tell a lot of story back then to my main protagonist. We have a bit more time. Um, Allison, indie filmmaker extraordinaire, um, do you have any questions for this project? I think all, uh, everybody else's questions were really helpful. Um, is this, uh, in terms of um, execution, do you see any um, challenges you mentioned that it's quite risky and dangerous for her, um, you know, and it looked like already, you know, things could, that you've shot have gotten tense. Are you prepared for that or any other challenges that, you know, you think are gonna come up in this six months? Not necessarily as obstacles even, but also the things that you're gonna get to see in the film. Sorry, can you repeat the last sentence? Sure, uh, a challenge not just that it would stop you from making it, but more what the viewer then will get to see. Like, you know, are there events in the next six months that you're looking ah. to film? Thank you for the question, it's really good. Um, so, um, because um, in January and February, there will be um, the, the how harvest season is going to be over, so mostly people, um, the villagers, they gather together during that month to go to guard their forest because everybody is free. And the challenging is that I had to challenge with the film. First, it's the logging case because sometimes you, you never go, you don't know who they're going to end up with, sometimes, like I said, with a gun or with a knife or violence. And the second thing is the authorities because I have to be honest here that Cambodia, it's, we had a super, super corrupt system. And one time authority also came over to me and asked me what am I doing there? And sometimes they want to stop me from filming. But um, by now I got in touch with one of the police. I invited him for a kind of drink or something. I was trying to explain, so now I could get in easily, but still I have um, a kind of warm protection from the in indigenous group also, that they always found a way for me to get inside the village. And every time I stay like one month or six weeks with them, and I went there like four or five times a year. So, I, because I just want to get to know them and the nature around. Um, do you, like, what are you just filming by yourself or do you have someone that works with you? Just curious what your team looks like. So, so far this trailer was made by its own, um, does research footage and I spent another one week, like one month before I came here. So, um, I was there all alone. Why? Because I didn't want to put other people in danger and I asked one of my sound men, he was not so sure. <laughs> It's a funny story. He said, I'm going to get married in one month. I said, okay, you don't have to come. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I think it's vital for me in, order, in, in terms of responsibility of other people. I think I want to go there. And sometimes being a solo filmmaker, it helps you a lot in terms of observations and being close to your protagonist. But if I get a funding, I think I will try to look for a sound man with me because sometimes like, oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe a sound man is could be a good idea, but maybe I should look for somebody who is single. <laughs> Are you going to marry? Okay, it's fine. <laughs> well, I think that's it for questions, but for 25K, hopefully you can get a sound person and more. Thank you so much for pitching. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, oh, so you guys made me feel very relaxed. Thank you so much for that. Uh, our next project is A View from the Edge by Jody Taylor and Chloe White. Uh, hi, I'm Jody Taylor. I'm the producer of A View from the Edge. Hi, I'm Chloe White, and I'm the director. I'd like to start by asking you to bring to mind a house or a home that has played host to thousands of memories for you. Oh. Uh, and one that you know inside out. Uh, 
Now imagine that in just a few short years, this house and the land around it and everything that means to you will be committed entirely to the sea. This is the extraordinary situation that our three characters currently find themselves facing. In the UK, and indeed in much of Europe, I think we're often guilty of thinking that climate change is something that happens to other people in other places. In fact, the UK is due to lose hundreds of thousands of homes to the sea this century due to rising sea levels and changing weather. Jodie and I live on the southeast coast of the UK, near the debris of houses that have already fallen into the sea. As a mother, I often worry what living in a coastal town will mean for my child. Our 15-minute documentary, A View from the Edge, will bring home the stark realities of climate change in the UK through the voices of the people who, is it, who it's affecting in the most visceral and personal way possible. We will tell these stories from the in-depth emotional perspective of what it means to lose a home, and we will use our filmmaking skills to build an atmospheric and haunting world that will stay with the audience long after the film has finished. It probably also hasn't escaped your attention that there is a natural and ironically poetic parallel between a physically shrinking Britain and a metaphorical one in the midst of our country's Brexit chaos. Uh, we are currently in the late stages of development with this film and we hope that our teaser will give you a little bit of a taster of what it's like. Everyone has a cliff coming towards them. The difference is we can see ours. January, local sea state update. Change since last month. No change, but jagged edge and small losses along the cliff path to the beach. I think we may have maybe three years more. The house I live in now, and it is the second house away from the cliff. It's the political crisis which surrounds the Brexit process. This was expected to be the pharaohs. Northwesterly, three of them. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. England, it is factually, physically getting smaller. I mean, England is going to change. February, local sea state update. Change since last month. Cliff loss approximately 500 millimetres. Loss of part of the hedge at the edge. My dad passed away in this house about three years ago, um, quite suddenly, and we found him in the back garden. The church and the graveyard where my dad is buried will eventually go into the sea if it will go in before my house or after my house. I'm not quite sure on the timing. Sort of losing that land would be quite hard. Sort of, it would just be thinner. I have picked up the odd cattle bones. I think it would be macabre to start finding human bones. It is happening and it is affecting me, me, my family, my house, my memories. March, local sea state update. Change since last month. Two meters cliff loss. Loss of a small tree. This is literally just gonna go, sort of open a walk away from this and then come back in a few years after maybe going to uni and it's just gone. The people on the beach, they wouldn't know about all this individual life that had gone on. It's just a waiting game. So our 
our three characters are all women, and our third character, who you didn't see, is Lauren, and her story will form the spine of the film. So Lauren is a 22-year-old butcher from the town of Fairbourn in North Wales, the first town in the UK to create an entire community of climate change refugees due to the upcoming decommissioning of the town following years of excessive flooding. We'll see Lauren as she packs her bags and leaves her home for the last time. As a mother of two, what will it mean for her to lose her home and her family business? Our second character is Darcy, 15, from Haysborough, the fastest eroding town in the UK. Her neighbours' homes have already fallen into the sea, and in two to three years, her own house will be lost. She's been stockpiling tangible memories of her home for an art project, audio of the dripping taps and the creaking floorboards, and photos of the, of the grass where she found her dead father, and we'll feature these in the film. Our final character is Juliet, who lives in the easternmost house in the UK, and she's been meticulously journaling the changes in the cliff edge outside. These observations will punctuate the film. Her thoughts are often expressed in philosophical meditations on the past and the future, and what it means to be faced with the reality of your own impermanence and morality. Outside in her garden, dinosaur fossils are gradually being exposed and lost, and Juliet mu muses on these disappearing layers in history and what it means to eventually become one of them. And the sea will hold the whole film together. These stark visuals will increasingly punctuate the film, injecting a mood of foreboding and reminding the audience of the threat our characters face. With a view from the edge, we will tell the stories of the people living right on the front line of a shrinking Britain, where their politicians are too distracted by bickering and infighting, and where the rest of the country too often assumes its own privilege and protection from the rest of the world's climate crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jody and Chloe. Um, a great uh, portrait of an ever-shrinking island. Um, I'll go to the jury for any feedback or comments, questions. Uh, thank you, thank you. Very interesting. I like the, that there are three stories that are intermingling. Um, can you tell us, uh, I'm curious because it looks for the trailer that sound is gonna play also an important role. I'm kind of curious, how are you? And also with the sea, and can you tell us more about this, these things? Uh, yeah, so yeah, so you're right, sound design will be really important. And it's sort of the sound that will, um, that will create this mood of like threat and tension and anxiety that we really want our audiences to feel when watching this, this film. It will also be through the audience, that, uh, the audio that will introduce um, quite important elements like the Brexit element and kind of the current political situation. So maybe through the radio, um, a lot where our characters live, you can hear radio from Holland, from France. Um, so we want radio to kind of play into the sound design of the film. And then that kind of constant whooshing of the sea, just reminding the audiences of that threat that lurks just outside all of our windows, um, but particularly our characters. Um, a very beautifully shot. And I have a question just which I didn't see in the trailer. Are you going to also include certain kind of, uh, I would say, comment or observation of the policy makers or whatever is playing actually in the background? Because, or are you going to focus on what people are suffering from? Because, yeah, I think that is the main part of your trailer, but I'm curious. Yeah, um, it's a really good question. Um, we have we've discussed it in depth and we feel that the most sort of the most powerful way that we can make this film is from the very personal intimate perspectives of the people who are being affected um we'll obviously have as chloe says in the background we'll have sort of snippets of news and and so you'll get a sense of what's bubbling under the surface with brexit politically but we don't really want to bash people over the head with it partly because i think everyone's a bit sick of hearing about brexit um so we just want it to sort of form a layer behind the film and uh, for it to also, you know, have this sort of foreboding threat in the same way that the sea has. Um, but yeah, certainly we won't make it the central part. I think it's the emotional stories. Um, very interesting. Um, I have a house by the sea as well, and I, <laughs> it's often affected by hurricanes, and I wonder when I'm going to get the beachfront. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I am curious, though, about that, that, that side of the neighbors, right? Like, do you, do you think you'll see some of the neighbors leaving or, the, you know, the, the, is there a friendship? Are they bound together? You know, I'm curious about that dynamic. Yeah. I, 
mean, certainly each of the communities are very small communities. And uh, with Haysborough, for example, where the 15-year-old Darcy lives, um, she's seen many of her neighbours already, either their houses go over the cliff, and there's a really interesting story with one of her neighbours who was in her 70s, I think, and just remained in the house until the very last minute when the bathroom was over the edge. And um, so there's lots of sort of stories in that sense. They already, she's the second house on the edge, so there'll be one to go before her. Uh, with Lauren, we'll actually see her leaving her home as a few of her other neighbours are doing, although the town won't be decommissioned for quite a while. Do you want to say anything mm. else? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of empty homes around where these people live, and that's the kind of reality. They're becoming sort of ghost towns. And that's quite, you know, I think we'd want to include that sort of weird emptiness, like these homes with, so even some of them still have furniture in, people have just upped and left. Hi. Since it sounds like each of the characters can get you into a world that's also their family or their neighborhoods. Can you talk more about why you picked three different ones and what kind of different perspectives you think they have personally, maybe not just like their circumstance, but like what they're each bringing to the film for you? I think uh, three always provides a good symmetry. And, um, but I think, um, yeah, we've got, I mean, we've got a young person, we've got an older person, and we've got sort of someone in the middle. Um, and they're all they're, they're quite interesting characters in themselves. I mean, Darcy um, lives with her mom. Her dad died. They have a pet duck that Darcy hates because it's pooing all over the house. Um, and she's got a younger sister who she bickers with a lot. Um, Juliet, the older woman, is a very sort of traditional um, kind of British. You know, she wears her oil skin, pearl earrings. Um, she has pictures of the Queen all over her house and stacks of Country Life magazine. And Union Jack's everywhere, and she'll almost be the kind of personification of one kind of the hard Brexit um, uh, argument. Um, and then we have the character Lauren, who's really important because she's sort of actually going to be leaving her home. Um, and so we'll create that kind of narrative thread throughout the film as we, as we see her kind of eventually moving out and see what that actually looks like. And, and she's also a mother, which I think is quite important. Um, and she owns a family business, so that's been in her family for years, and she's about to sort of have to up and leave that. So she's sort of more of the the heritage of the place. Or the, um, yeah. Judy, do you have any comments? Um, yeah, I, I see, um, when I see visually the way that you've shot it, it's these, these women often facing the sea, occasionally from the side, very much islands. They feel like themselves islands, you know, looking out as, as even their lives are about to be swept away. And I just wondered, is that, sort of the, the visual look that you see carrying through the whole 15 minutes? Or will we ever see these three very different, but yet, you know, facing similar, prob the, these three women, will we ever see them coming together? Will we ever sense a community? Or, or is that the kind of way mm. that you'll treat each of the stories in this sort of quite lonely um, way, each waiting for its own, their own fate to come and sweep them away? That's, I mean, definitely that will be a big part of it, but I think we will see some interaction, um, at least visually, with their families and their family members, so they won't feel sort of completely isolated. But I think, you know, it's a view from the edge. It's sort of their view from their place where they live um, on, the, on the coast. Um, so we want to kind of really emphasize that, but we will see other characters with them um, and, and see that kind of nice dynamic that they have with their communities and their families. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we're completely... I agree, you know, Chloe's right. And I, but I think because we'll be, um, you know, producing it with, the, with If Then and, and if, you know, if there's an editorial suggestion to have them all speaking to each other, then perhaps we could look at that. But I think our intention was to have them sort of individually telling their stories. We have about one minute left, if there's any more injury feedback. I sort of had a follow-up to my question. So I have a good sense now of how like the different perspectives there um, sort of biographically and demographically they bring. Do they have a difference of opinion about the, you know, about climate change or about what's happening to their homes? Or do they kind of all share the same kind of feeling about the fate that they're facing? I think certainly they all face a very similar threat. So I think that, for example, I don't think Juliet would have, before being in the 
easternmost house in the UK. I don't think she would have particularly felt strongly about climate change, but I think she now faces it very viscerally and, and it's, she's living with it every day. So I think each of them do now feel, and, and Darcy says in her, in the trailer, and you know, and we talked to her a lot about the fact that she, she didn't care about climate change at all before, she didn't know anything about it, but now she's having to deal and face it sort of head on every day and, and much of her community is. Um, so in the, in the climate change sense, I think they now all you know, face a strong uh, imminent threat. But in terms of sort of the Brexit issue, I think there's, there's quite a diversity of, of opinions in our characters. But I think, um, you know, they're sort of like normal people and the word climate change isn't used a lot for them because it's, you know, this is just, they, this has been something that they've been living with for a while and, but they're seeing rapidly, actually rapidly increase, you know, so, um, and, you know, Darcy's 15 and she just wants to hang out with her friends and her boyfriend. So, you know, she's not thinking a lot and talking a lot about climate change, but it's just something that is annoying for her and has infiltrated her life in a way that, you know, she doesn't want it to. Um, yeah, but, you know, I don't think she... You know, when we asked her about climate change, I don't think she's even that aware of what climate change is. You know, she, she wasn't, she's not really clear about how, what, you know, how climate change is related to her, her own situation, but she knows it is, you know. So, yeah. I feel like that's a universal theme. Thank you so much, um, and congratulations. Thank you. Um, our next project is out of Dominica, the third season. Uh, so please come on up, Stephanie and Zephyrine. Hi everyone, I'm Stéphanie Saxema. I am a filmmaker from Martinique in the Caribbean and I'm the director of the third season. Hi, I'm Zephyr Ray. I'm the film's producer and I'm also from, well, from Dominica, from the Caribbean. Our film spans a five-year period and takes us on an intimate voyage um, into the life of Rennie, a 12-year-old boy who searches for a new normal after Hurricane Maria devastates his island, Dominica, in 2017. Between snapshots, of an idyllic vision of childhood, a metaphor to pre-hurricane Dominica, we follow Rennie in his day-to-day -day present life as he focus, focuses on passing his um, first year of high school. When Zephyrin introduced me to Rennie, his, uh, her little cousin, five years ago, one of the first things he told me was that he's a merman. He uh, lives on land, but uh, when he goes into water, he's tail grows and he swims like a fish. Um, the element of water is a constant in Rennie's life and is central to our film. Water is as much a destructive force as it is uh, a force of healing and, and um, a source of life and healing, sorry. As Rennie tells his stories of mer people um, and place in the river emerges his present reality um, with his imaginary world. So Rene is my little cousin. I have seen him grow up and I've always been a very big part of his life. And um, he's a sensitive, thoughtful and funny boy. He loves uh, singing and drawing, uh, hairstyling and doing manicures. But he's, it's also been very difficult for him to just be himself. He's been bullied in the past at school and he even had to change schools because of that. Um, we would like to introduce you to Rene. Um, in this, in our video sample, it's a short, it's a small glimpse into his world, um, his love for storytelling and theatrics, and it also shows the close relationship between the filmmakers, ourselves, and uh, Rennie. Mm -hmm. Get my come on. It's not as beautiful as the others, but it's getting better. But keep going now. Make it make fully finish your bread. Okay. <laughs> where, where am I? It looks so big and majestic. Just put your hand here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Almost. 
Go come sister, brother. Come with mama. Come to mama. This man wants to go on land. But the thing is, he doesn't know nothing about land. So, and he's banned from going on land because women and mermaids and humans are not supposed to be together. So, I know my my people, my mer people, who don't want me there, but like, I just break a rule. And then he goes up there and then he speaks this, this kind of thing, but he still, and then he gets feet. And he's naked because, like, obviously, there's still some clothes, he puts it on, and he wanders around. Rene now lives in a small food caravan on the petro oil refinery on the bank of the Layu River. He lives with his father, Jacob, his stepmother, Joycey, and their two dogs and two cats. The family is still waiting on government assistance to rebuild their homes after Hurricane Maria. It's been two years. They're quite isolated because they live on an industrial site. Um, the caravan has no electricity or running water, and in the sample we see Rennie trying to get water from a hose on the oil refinery, because this is where they get water at the end of the day when the plant uh, closes. The story is told from the personal point of view of Rennie. It mixes narration in non-linear prose with intimate on-screen dialogues between characters. The film structure takes us on a bittersweet journey through what has been um, the things we lost in the fire, and into a close exploration of what happens to those who stand in the ashes, children who are forced to grow up faster. With this film, we want to evoke the passage from childhood to teenagehood, from carefreeness to consciousness of loss, from before Hurricane Maria to after Hurricane Maria. We want to place the emphasis on the emotional representation rather than the objective reality. With this screen, with this film, we really want to tell the story of Caribbean people from places we rarely, if ever, see uh, on screen. And we want to help rewrite the narrative of the Caribbean region as more than just a paradisiac tropical uh, destination. So this is not a film with sensational images of destruction and despair post-hurricane. This is a character-centered personal story of one child whose life has been dramatically affected by climate change. This is the only film on the effects of climate change in Dominica, and it's also one of the very rare documentaries produced by a Dominican team. The film is currently in development, and with this aid, we'll be able to begin production and complete the film. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for this uh, portrait of, you know, who's really going to have to pay the bill of this climate change uh, disaster. Um, I'm coming to the jury for some feedback and comments. I want to pick on my boss, Amy Hobby, to go first. Hi. Um, thanks for that very beautiful portrait. Um, uh, do you have footage? I'm curious if you have footage because you're talking about before the hurricane and after the hurricane. Do you have footage of Rennie before the hurricane when he was younger so that the transition is seen as well as talked about? So yes, we, we do have footage of Rennie. We, I started shooting um, four years ago. So we have footage of him very young, uh, mostly near a river because when I would go to Dominica, this is really the place he would, he would want to go. He would beg to go to the river. So 
I have footage of him very young, um, learning how to swim, um, and um, with his grandmother as well. Um, we didn't say it, but he, he used to live with his grandmother, but uh, after Hurricane Maya, she had to move to the US. So um, not only he lost his home, um, but he also lost you know, his m main reference in life. I'm curious, um, is there anything coming up in the coming months? or the, are, What are your references that you think, because you're talking a lot about past and present and before and after, are there specific things that you think, oh, this, this is going to help me with the storyline because in a couple of months this is going to happen, mm -hmm. or things that happened also already in the past? So we have two major things that can happen in Rennie's life. Um, he failed the last year of life high school. So after the hurricane, he had to actually leave Dominica. He went to Martinique. The request for a climate refugee visa was refused. So then he went to Barbados, and then he came back to Dominica one year later. And he failed his first year of high school. So he's now focusing on passing the first year, which is right now. So um, this is like a big part of his life right now that's at stake for him. Um, he feels a lot of pressure because his father is working two jobs, and he sees his father is killing himself to pay for his studies, so he has that pressure. They also recently received um, a government promise for a new house, so they've started making preparations for the place where they will put the house, and we're expecting a construction of the house to begin uh, by the end of this year, and hopefully that will be done by the time we finish the film in about six months. So those are, that's something that would change a lot for the, for the family in terms of their living conditions, yeah. They actually have started, um, so they have a land where they had their old house, and they have started cleaning the land for the, the government to come and, and start building. And they're very excited. They, I think we are at a pivotal moment of their um, life after Maria, after Hurricane Maria. Um, I think that uh, today they really, um, waiting for this change. They're ready for it, and they're also very ready to express um, things that were so difficult to express before, all three of them. Um, so, yeah. I'm kind of curious to know a little bit more about this boy. Uh, like, uh, what kind of language he's going to speak in the film? Because I think for the trailer, he's using English. He speaks Wait, English, yes. Okay, so he speaks English, that. Okay. But doesn't seem to be his uh, mother tongue, is it? Or is it? Is it, um, it is. It is his mother tongue. Oh, really? It's okay. true that in Dominica, uh, well, Zephyrin is well placed to say it, but um, there is um, institutional English, I would say. Mm, standard, um, standard, standard, standard English, English yeah. and uh, Dominican English. And probably what you heard is him speaking maybe a bit of Dominican English. That, that makes, oh, yes. Nice. Okay, all right. Yeah. And does he have like playmates uh, with whom he'll kind of, because kids talk about stuff, right? So I'm kind of curious to know whether it's going to be in the film. And what are we going to see him do? And he's going to do swimming, I think, and maybe also other things. So just, uh, just to get an image. So, um, Rennie is a very sociable kid. Um, he loves people, he loves uh, going to see his friends. Um, but I think that he's a bit suffering from the situation he's in. Um, he feels isolated because of where he lives. He's very ashamed of living there. Um, he, he literally lives on the plant of Petro Caribe, um, you know, where they, um, it's an oil refinery. Oil refinery. And he doesn't want people to know where he lives. So I think that he's kind of um, um, isolating himself from others. Although when he's at school or things like that, he's very, um, he has a lot of friends. Um, we don't really say it in the, and show it in the film voluntarily, but Ren is different. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, he has been, he has had problems in Dominica because of the way he is, the way he behaves. Um, they find him to effeminate, should I say? Yeah, that's good. <coughs> effeminate, and, and I think that what I find amazing with him is he doesn't really care. <laughs> he, he just weighs, and, and he, he, if 
someone has a problem with him, then it's okay, you know? He, he kind of um, just keep going despite everything. Um, He's quite philosophical, Rennie. He has a lot of very philosophical things that he says yeah. like to us all the time. Very, like things that you would hear in like the self-development circles and we say, is this like a 12-year-old child, like my little cousin saying this to me. Yeah. Very wise, uh, yes. Wise beyond his, his years. Exactly. I'm not sure I answer the question. The scenes, maybe other things. Oh, yeah, the see. scenes. Um, so we're going to see him, um, of course, swimming, um, but also playing with his dogs. Um, as you know, you noticed, he, um, he may not have friends around, but you know, he has two dogs, two cats, and the, the, his dog, for example, um, walk him uh, to the bus every morning and at night wait for him, and then go back walking home. Um, we also see him on the phone with his grandmother, who is now in the US. Um, they can't talk very often because they don't have electricity, so they can't charge you know, the phone and, and other things um, very regularly, but um, like, that's something they do um, um, frequently. Um, we also see him, maybe I forget something, doing his uh, homework. Yes. Um, the homework is something important because um, they, Rennie has been diagnosed with, um, what's the word? Oh, he the, says that his teacher says that he has a disorder. disorder. He doesn't know what the disorder is, but yeah. he, ha he has a problem. So they, they have paid for him to have extra classes and that's, what, that's part of the whole pressure of not having a financial situation that allows it, but you know, trying to do the best so that he can succeed. And um, yes. Um, yeah, I think you'll be the last question, Judy. Okay. Um, is just really quirky and and strange, but in a beautiful way. Like I'd I'd like to hang out with him for sure. Like it, yeah. um, but because he's so self-contained, um, even though you're both speaking to the things that he's lost, I don't feel like he he feels like he's <laughs> lost stuff. And I I just wondered if uh, things like the house, you know, the, the evidence of the house that washed away or, or the, 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 the refinery that he lives in, these places or things of loss will feature in the film because he looks, he looks pretty cool hanging out thinking about mermaids and, you know, mermen and, and um, but I, I, yeah, I'm curious about how and when we will see or feel the, the loss in the film. Um, you actually, um <clears throat> See him uh, at the river, it's true. But um, Rennie is very joyful. Um, he, he is a happy person in general. Um, but right now, this is not really the same person. Um, he, um, how would I say that? He, um, when when he talks with you about you know his life today, um, I don't I didn't show everything in the trailer because I mean in the sample because I really wanted to focus on you know you seeing him and the relationship, uh, but he's really frustrated about his life right now and um, what he does. I didn't all I didn't want to focus o only on in the sample on the house and I mean the, the caravan they live in. Um, because I thought that it was more important to see him and out of the environment. Because this is a bit what he's doing, is getting out in his head, you know, and sometimes in the way he behaves, in the way he, uh, he talks to you, he sort of extirps himself from yes. where he's living. It's, for me, this is a way of surviving. Yes. And, yeah. Um, I, yes, uh, Rennie, as you're saying, he's a very joyful child and he finds, he has these ways of sort of removing himself from a situation or using humor. Uh, so in one, in one scene where we're at the river with him and he's talking about the hurricane and he's actually, I, I mean, I've known Rennie and I, I did not even know these details because as we go along, he keeps like going back to things and telling us little stories and he's telling us that um, after the hurricane, they went looting and he said, well, everybody was looting, so we did it too. And we got 
velvet cake and he's like, we had a ton of velvet cake. Like we just ate velvet cake and milkshakes every day. It was, it was so good. And we had like a pail of chicken, but the chicken, there were worms in it. So we made barbecue for the dogs. And like he just like breaks down. Like he's like laughing like so hard. And like we start laughing because it's absolutely hilarious. But at the same time, you know, like as an adult, you know that, you know, the, the gravity of the situation. And like with some distance, like now we're laughing, but it's really, you know. And when we look at uh, the images of his life before, we really have this feel of like an idyllic childhood because it was that. And we, there will be, um, I appear in scenes of his earlier life because we did a lot of stuff together. So we go looking for fruits in the garden and we're playing and he'd, we, you know, I used to tell stories with Rennie a lot. So we have scenes of him and I, just him telling me stories about mermaid and um, Pegasus and the forest and fairies, etc. And when we compare it, you know, we have this contrast between then and his life now, we get the feel of these things that were lost, I think. Thank you so much uh, for this amazing story out of the Caribbean. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have a film out of Bhutan, Mountain Man. Arun, come on up. Hello. Can you hear behind? Just checking. Hello, hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Arun Batrai, and I'm a filmmaker from the Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan. Um, I'm the director of Mountain Man. Uh, let me take you to the top of the Himalayas where, um, where no one actually goes to. Uh, it's pristine with uh, snowy peaks, crystal clear uh, lakes and myths surrounding them. But within its hypnotic beauty lurks danger. No one climbs up to these mountains or even uh, touches these lakes because in Bhutan uh, they are considered to be uh, holy and as an abode of the gods. However, in the last few years, uh, this rule got broken and one man got permission to climb up. He is Funso Tsering, my main character. Funso Tsering is the only glaciologist in Bhutan who has to hike up the mountains for several days through very dangerous terrain to measure the glaciers that are rapidly melting due to climate change. Funso was my classmate and close friend from high school. And I've always remembered him to be a very sensitive but persistent person who always liked to lead from the front. My film, uh, Mountain Man, is a sensorial experience. It is an immersive journey as we follow Funso and his team who risk their life in order to protect the people downstream from glacial lake outbursts. Let me now introduce you to the world of my main character. Uh, this video sample uh, was made out from Funso's own footage that was shot uh, during his last journey. Cheta kekso wajigi kato namsi juro gine tangan zoom chine hebdalo. Cheta kekso gi thokalo labi mi toa kimi. ま、ばなじんなんさめゆやみんとてがゆるめろにみぴとちらめば。てあなれべ、てんがれてなのラチペワチンアチ。レジンジョンにものべ、なんのにとんぐれこつつべ。てけだ。てれきつおはんにけ
Jodaya, Ninam, Chutam, Chuchi, Juni, Hanzum go with Yisaka Chalam, Jubi, Keda Keto did. Jodalu, Namkalon, Sami, Kanyil, Rangi, Sulu at Wigi Kanyil, Jumi, Hachigi. Ani lato fo me di su mamra ya juma su ke kanyel teme. Ani be rangi su di rangi khana su ya bak tele paongo binga chal. Gaji ki na lo di nam misa me nyang khayu bi nam khaya toro na le ba su ko. Tale lumina leva jo pe chuge lage pe jo galen rangi so le ne kin jundi nam sami ne inga yube. Nagis. Sina albatu ya. Si. Oret. The, the film, uh, it starts in Funso's office that looks more like a nomad's tent than the office of a typical glaciologist. Uh, it is filled uh, with uh, horse baskets that will carry the heavy equipment uh, uphill. Uh, the trip will take five weeks when through long observational moments, I will capture the emotional tension of this uh, extraordinary physical task. From time to time during the journey, they stop and pray to the mountain gods not to angry them. We will see their struggle with nature while they are trying to measure the glaciers, establish early warning systems, and identify uh, safety evacuation zones along the rivers downstream. During the journey, we will feel the innermost struggle, exhaustion, fear, and relief. In the evenings, as they set up their tents, they will talk about their family back home uh, who are waiting for them to return home safe. The poetic style of the film will express the spiritual and fearful relationship between humans and nature that had to be broken as a consequence of climate change. Uh, Bhutan has close to 3,000 lakes, uh, 3,000 glacier lakes. Many of them have turned into ticking time bombs because of rapid melting of ice. A glacial lake outburst would wash away the valley downstream, affecting villages, infrastructure, and biodiversity. Funso's genuine passion and noble sacrifice to prevent the effects of a glacial lake outburst made me decide to follow him. I'm one of the few documentary filmmakers in Bhutan, and I feel that I also share the same responsibility like Funso to raise attention to this very important issue of climate change. I got a unique access to accompany Funso, but it's also an extraordinary physical task that will take the viewers to a cinematic journey that would not, not be able to experience otherwise. In this film, I want the audience to feel under their own skin what it takes for you to risk your life in order to protect your community. My film is in its early development stage. With this support, I could develop and complete the film. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arun. I do not envy you walking through the Himalayas for 11 days um, in the freezing cold. I will, um, I'll come to the jury. Um, Raul, can I pick on you first? Um, I'm going, do you have also footage from, from his previous journeys? Uh, I have to go and film with him. Uh, this footage was uh, from his own, own foot, like, from his last journey that I shot, which I made especially for this, for the, as a trailer. But uh, in, in the next few months, I'm going with him for in for shorter uh, like uh, journeys through like smaller valleys. Training. Uh, training, <laughs> yes. And after that, I'm going for the big, big trip. Yes. Can you tell us more about the trip? How long is it, and how? So the trip, the big trip, mm -hmm. it, it it is five weeks because uh, it is uh, 11 days going up, and then they stay there for like uh, 15 days, and then it's uh, again 11 days 
coming back. So it's like it's about four to five weeks the actual journey up up the mountain. Yeah. And and just wondering is uh, is he very pessimistic? Where, where what in his point of view every time he goes is getting kind of um, very pessimistic how yes. everything is going. Yeah. Yeah, for him, uh, he has to go uh, every year, and also sometimes he has to go suddenly if there is a call that this uh, glacial lake is actually kind of increasing in size than its normal size. So he has to take these ad hoc uh, trips as well uphill. So it is actually, he's, I mean, for him it's like very clear that he's noticing that every year the glaciers are melting faster than usual. Hi, um, it's amazing, nerve wracking. Um, do, you, do you think, um, is there any thought that you might be part of the story as well? Because you know, he's your um, friend, um, high school friend, and um, put, he's putting himself in danger in this way, and you're going on this journey with him. Will, will that come into play at all in the film? I, I do think that even if I if I try to avoid, I will be in some ways a part of the film because the the journey itself is very tough, and I think there will be times when when he will react or he will talk to me about what's happening in front, and at the same time there might be times that maybe he might have to talk to me and help me as well. So so I am I am I'm quite sure that I will be also part of this film in a subtle way. Is your plan to function as a one-person crew? Um, tell me more about how, how you're going to capture this trip. Yeah. So uh, I'll have a sound person with me, and I'll do the filming myself. Uh, uh, and I'll have probably another person to help with luggage and stuff and because we'll also have to have a horse probably behind <laughs> so but I, I do the filming most of the time I I usually film my own own films uh, so so yeah I, I'm, I'm doing the cinematography but I'll have a sound person have you done I mean film like this before like because I think it's my minus I don't know how much <laughs> do you have enough battery <laughs> 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 yeah so uh, it like one of the advantages is because they carry their, their huge equipment they also carry generators so uh, that that part is solved um, but uh, uh, I haven't done I mean of course I haven't done this kind of big trip but I have done because I used to work for the television station in Bhutan before, so I have a lot of experience of of going on a lot of lot of hikes. Not as tough as this, but yeah. So does that mean you'll be able to capture things that even you know the average viewer in Bhutan wouldn't have seen? You're saying he's going to places that people don't normally go. Yes, because people don't know that uh, there is this little small group of people who are going up every year to measure the glaciers, they have no idea about it. So that's why it's, it's something quite unique. I mean, people have not really seen that part. I mean, when Funso was showing me his own footage, I myself was like, because I, I was also surprised that, you know, like this actually happens and there is like so much happening up there. So I was thinking in this. So, so I, you are kind of relying more on the visuals, like the images will take over. But I, I think you also want him to speak about it, and because it will be, I think it will be very interesting with all his expertise to also take us into that journey. But I, on the other hand, the visuals will be also spot on because nobody has seen. But how, how do you see the balance? Uh, are you going to plan, plan more interviews with him and? Yes, I'm, uh, I would like to do more. I would like to talk to him before the journey, like maybe do, do his voiceover and then maybe after the journey as well. 
uh, then that will be more like reflexive, I think. Uh, but I'm planning to keep a minimum uh, of his voice and more because I want the journey itself. Because in some way, it's very meditative as well, this journey through, through the mountain. Because they are also very scared, also because they have the belief that the mountains are gods. So that's why th when through the journey at different points, they stop to sometimes pray to the mountains, not to make them angry. They don't eat meat. Uh, so it's like, a, uh, so it's, it's some way a very meditative kind of journey. So I, I would like to concentrate a lot on these very silent moments through, through the snow as well. Uh, because often they don't talk to each other, but it's a very silent journey through the snow. I just have one more question, which you may not be able to answer, but d does your friend have thoughts on, do you think he has thoughts on solutions or what uh, the people of Bhutan can do? Because um, it seems like the government of Bhutan is not an antagonist, you know, in any way. Um, the trouble comes from other places, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no, not really. The only the, the only solution they provide is that they uh, have this early warning systems. They put up uh, like downstream because all the glacial lakes they form the rivers downstream, and then they also kind of identify safety evacuation zones. But when I was talking to my friend, what he was saying is that. It's going to happen like sooner or later. The glacial lake is going to burst, and it's very difficult to predict when exactly, uh, because especially during the summers when the when the heat is higher than normal, the the lakes might just burst. So because uh, recently also a few years ago there was a lake burst. I think that's it for questions. Thank you so much. Ray. Thank you. We're getting close to the finish line. Um, our next film is Vena Aquatica by um, Amada Torre. If I can get this on. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Amada. Here we go. Testing. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Amada Torre, and I'm a Salvadoran storyteller. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the wonderful people at Tribeca IDFA, Riot, for having us today. I'm here with uh, my producer and film family, Seth, who's right there. Hey, Seth. Uh, so as a Central American migrant, uh, I have experienced the trauma that comes with displacement from one's land during a period of war. Uh, I am currently in the process of overturning my own inferiority complex, stemming from feelings of invisibility experienced outside of my country. I am keenly aware of how stories of violence and corruption dominate our identity. And I'm giving myself permission with this project as director to envision new narratives for El Salvador. Our film, Vena Acuatica, shows there are deeper underlying issues in the region, such as climate change, and offers a counter narrative led by the eco feminist belief that the way society treats its water and the way society treats women are inextricably linked. This project is a personal story for me. Uh, I traveled around my country for three months, connecting with different communities impacted by the climate crisis in El Salvador, and I partnered with eco-feminist organizers who introduced me to, remote, to a remote lakeside fishing village in border town with Guatemala. It is here in this village that I was welcomed with open arms by Mirna Perez and her family. This video clip that I am going to share with you today is not a teaser. Um, it does not represent the structure of our film. It is simply footage from the time that we as a team have spent together with this community to get to know them and get to know their surroundings and their day to day. So, um, yeah, you're going to see uh, three gem generations of women. Mirna, Mirna's daughter-in-law, Dinora, uh, her granddaughter, Monica. Uh, they are the center of this film. And this clip is meant to give you a sense of place, a sense of their connection to the water. Um, it's an intimate glimpse at the world of Vena Aquatica. Uh, the opening scene features Mirna and her husband, Chilano, fishing as they do every morning. Go, Peter. <laughs>
para que nos dé el sabor que da la pupusa de pescado. ¿Qué tipo de pescado es? Es tilapia. Our clip ends with footage from the inauguration of El Salvador's new president, Nayib Bukele. During this moment of unrest around the first candidate to defeat the country's two-party system since the end of our civil war in 1992, of all things, the crowd broke out in the popular Salvadoran water chant, El agua no se vende, se cuida y se defiende. Water isn't recognized as a human right in El Salvador. There are no laws protecting water against privatization. In fact, El Salvador has the lowest water reserves in all of Central America. And according to experts, the country will run out of water within 80 years. Today, Mirna's village is practically cut off from the outside world. The government utilities and humanitarian organizations that once supplied water quality control and aid have abandoned those services in the last decade. But Mirna is amazing and has taken matters into her own hands by learning to be an activist leader in her, in her community. Not because she wants to, but because it's necessary for her family's survival. Our team has been working on this for a year, and we are more than ready to return to El Salvador in February 2020 to finish production. Our story is unique because it's an intimate story of one family's fragile eco ecosystem directly impacted by the effects of climate change. The only alternatives that Mirna, her family, and people like them in the community is either to migrate or perish with the destruction of their home. And I would just like to share a few highlights of how we envision the story unfolding. Mirna's family has access to potable water for one single hour every four days. So capturing this hour will be important. We will follow Mirna as she teaches uh, Monica and Dinora how to monitor the water. As, she, she, as you saw, she's a self-taught scientist, so she will pass on this knowledge. We will experience Monica leading climate change school assignments with her classmates and accompany Dinora as she finds her voice as a young activist. Our storm story will come in, culminate in March 2020 during the Latin America's regional protest day against femicide and gender-based violence. Um, so it will be a water rally like any other. This will be Monica's first mass protest, and her perspective, of course, is key because she is the immediate inheritor of El Salvador's growing climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Amara. Lots of themes, um, gender, water warriors. And I, yeah. <laughs> I would like to invite Seth to join me for the question and answer. Um, I think, yeah, Thank we'll you. get another mic going. In the meantime, my great jury, any feedback? Thank you so much. A lot of the um, information you just gave about uh, the situation specific to the region and water um, is really important. Do you th think that the film is going to communicate that? Some some of the like, you know, bigger, you know, facts and figures, and how how would you do that to contextualize, you know, her experience and her journey? So that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, yes, so uh, the, as I learned uh, in this past year, and especially during those three months going around in different communities, uh, the water issue in El Salvador is very complex. It's extremely layered. And 
in every single corner of my country, communities are affected by it in various ways. So uh, because my, of my relationship with Mirna, and uh, she, she teaches me so much, um, and she, she is really someone that has learned how to you know, face this crisis on her own. Um, I, I realized that, you know, this was the family that I wanted to, to kind of like, you know, through them as vessels and as a story, uh, be able to, to show some of those layers. And so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this community in particular gets one hour of water every four days. And so you see the Nora washing dishes and get, getting everything ready. You see those tubs filled with water. That's during that hour. They only have a, an hour to collect as much water as they can. And, you know, that's her at work, trying to make the most of that hour. She works round the clock every second. Um, so I know that that hour is going to be very important to the story and how we tell it, um, so that you could see uh, some of those effects. And then, of course, through the the following of these women to this manifestation in March is also another way because these women live in an isolated community. It's a rural area, so it's a really big deal for them to come to the capital. You know, we're gonna have to get vans and everything together for them because they don't have cars um, so that they can express their voice. And so that moment in time is also gonna be a way because it's gonna be a reunion with the eco-feminist movement, and you're gonna be able to understand it from that perspective. Um, the film is gonna be really intimate and observational, so it's more about understanding this layered issue through, um, through their personal lives and their day-to-day. -day. Yeah, the... the figure that you gave is really shocking that you know um, that in 80 years the, the whole country is going to run out of water is that something that our characters know and understand and is that reflected or will it be reflected at all in the film or not so um, the way that Amara um, met this family and the way that we encountered this family is through the ecofeminist movement. And so these are organizers that, that travel all over El Salvador and meet with these small communities and have community conversations and, and begin to, to um, educate on, on the things that a people can do to uh, build resilience. And so yes, they very much I know these facts and these ideas, and it, it's surprising how much they know about this crisis. And um, as, um, I don't know if you, if you were able to get to it, any, but it's like, it's not something that they necessarily want to know, and it's not that they necessarily want to be activists, it's, it's a necessity. And um, it very much will, in some form or fashion, be a part of this a film, whether it ends up being in a conversation or has to be words on a screen, um, it'll be there for sure. And just to piggyback on that, so as you see, this community, this fishing village is located on a shore of a lake. It's called Lake Guija. Um, it's one of the main wetlands in the country. And what's really, I find poetic about this area is that it's the main tribut tributary to Central America's biggest river, the Lempa River. So that's where they're located, like at the beginning of this like water backbone, which is where our name comes from, vena aquatica, water vein, you know? And uh, Mirna and her community, they know just how important this lake is. They live off of it, but they understand that they're alone in that understanding um, of its importance. Um. I'm, I'm curious if um, the lake is polluted or under threat of pollution, and if your characters um, have awareness of that. Because there's a lot of um, also seepage from gar There's a lot of stuff going on in El Salvador around that. <laughs> yeah. So that's layered as well. Um, uh, 
uh, the immediate threat on Lake Weha is the largest cement factory um, in, in the country of El Salvador. And so when you talk about a community getting one hour of water every four days and then right along the shore nearby, there's a cement factory that's running nonstop, unregulated, completely unchecked. There's no laws in this country to protect uh, 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 the water, not to mention the communities around that. That, that lake, not to mention it's shared with Guatemala. That's why Mirna goes out once a week, sometimes more, to monitor the, uh, the levels of parasites in the water. She goes out there to monitor uh, uh, the acidic levels. She's looking at fauna. If that uh, changes from season to season, she doesn't, she's not a scientist. She, she doesn't always know what these different things mean but she knows that the changing of them means something and that gives her the ability to go answer those questions. So one follow-up, are there certain objectives of her and her community to either shut down the cement plant, like when they're marching, are there um, certain political goals? Is there some uh, tangible, tangible specific thing that they're uh, focused on? Yes, so, <laughs> Obviously, having a stronger regulation and management over uh, the privatization, you know, and the you know the fact that this water is being commodified by places like this concrete plant is a, is a key goal. But before that, before they can get to that, their main goal is to one make sure that uh, water is recognized as a human right because it isn't, and then two, make sure that there's a law that you know uh, protects water from the privatization. Because right now, that law isn't there, and so uh, apart from you know cement plants and extraction uh, of water by uh, the cane sugar industry, for example, um, that all of that isn't controlled. So it's. Uh, it's first some laws need to be passed and that's like their first their immediate response through their activism. And that's a much larger question. Um, what we're looking at is this very specific family and what they're doing, but we are, there is another community like Cuevitas where uh, Mirna lives that's right next to the cement plant. And um, we've been meeting with them and talking to them and that's a, another thing to explore that we would definitely love to discuss more. Great. Thank you so much, Seth and Amata. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you. I don't know what it says about me that I really want an eco-feminist t-shirt, but I'm sure it's not a good thing because um, it's pure capitalism. Um, our last project is coming up, which is a uh, Berry Dead Mountain, as Caitlin laughs at me from the front row. Come on up, Paul. <laughs> Um, hello, everyone. We are from Thailand. My name is Primrin Puarat. Um, I'm the director of the Buried Dead Mountain. Hi, I'm Palm. I'm the producer. There is a mountain in Chonburi, Thailand, that if you look at it from afar, you may not know that under it lies three million tons of waste that has been buried, tucked away, and hidden from the public eye. It's hard to believe that this is the equivalent weight of 10 Empire State Buildings or a million elephants. This dump site in Chonburi has been accumulating trash for over 40 years, and it, ha it has grown as tall as a mountain that is continually expanding and elevating. When I first learned about the waste mismanagement crisis in Thailand, I was surprised by the lack of the attention to this issue. Two years ago, I met Professor Somnuk. He is the Thai environmental activist who introduced me to this dump site in Chonburi. And when I got funding from Thai PBS to do research on climate change, I went with my team to scout and film th this dump site. So I would like to show you the teaser that we have been scouting.
อันนี้มันผู้เขาอันนี้มันมันขยะขยะขยะพื้นที่เรียบเรียบคือผมพูดไปหาหน่อไม้กับพ่อใหญ่ที่ผมขึ้นมาดีแล้วมันก็มีหน่อไม้พื้นที่ไม่ต้นดูข้าวเดี๋ยวมีเพราะเขาเพราะยางมันไปขุดมาเกิดไปเรื่อยจี๊ก็มินกินมินกินอะไรอย่างเงี้ยมันก็อยู่ได้นะไม่ได้ร้องเรียนไม่ได้อะไรแล้วเพราะว่าร้องเรียนบ่อยแล้วมันก็ไม่ได้ช่วยอะไรเลยเป็นการใช้กฎหมายเร่งรัดการจัดทำผังเมืองเพื่อตอบโจทย์การพัฒนาเศรษฐกิจโดยไม่คำนึงถึงการมีส่วนร่วมของประชาชนอย่างแท้จริงเวนาอเคทีในสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดีที่สุดเพราะมันเป็นสิ่งที่ดี Like the activists you see in the sample and Professor Somnuk, who are deeply passionate and deeply and passionately um, working for the people. Currently, we are in development, and the next step is to identify characters. We want to spend six to eight weeks on the field to build relationships with the people in Chonburi, um, and with the support, our team will be ready to go into production in February. And this is the urgent story. Um, the urgent. Story, just like the methane that you see on the screen, there are consequences to our actions. The mountain, much like our planet, is building up pressure. Everything is held in intention, waiting for the catalyst to set off the explosion. Maybe tomorrow. In the past two years, Thailand has seen 23 dump sites set fire due to its summer. We need to start making changes now in order to prevent the permanent damage on our earth. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you. Closing us out all the way from Thailand. Um, coming over to our jurors. Um, Judy, have I picked on you to go first yet? Is it time? I think it's time. <laughs> uh, I tried to avoid your eye and it didn't work. <laughs> Hiding in the middle. Okay, it's interesting because we have a dump site that's so like this in, in Kenya. It's called Dandora. Um, and so it reminded me so much of that. Um, I'm curious about the, yeah, the characters that you're going to, to, to pick on to capture the, the ugly beauty, as you called it, of, of this mountain. Um, because there are already so many characters, the kids digging through trash, the green men, the, you know, um, the, the old people working around it affected by that, that incredible stench. And so are you still exploring which characters you will pick for this short film or do you, do you have some kind of idea? Um, for when I, when I went to the, the, the trip, the research trip, this one, I, I talked a lot with uh, uh, locals and there are many locals, residents who, who are really have, uh, emotional about like the stench that have faced for like 10 or 20 years that have lived and that's um we i would like to um but because they are afraid of of showing out in if we shoot them so i would i i'm thinking and they don't and they don't know me what like very well so i i'm thinking that building trust with them and i will try to to hear, hear his um, their voices from 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 these kind of um, um, people, and they're also um, like like the people who are affected by the polluted pond that from the the mountain. Um, um, that for example, like like I, I found the Burmese um, immigrant workers who always like pick up the vegetables from the polluted pond to make food. Um, and also I found like um, the fishermen who um, um, go into the sea like every day and that's what I want to, to, to hear from them. And just to also add, um, this issue is really complex, like this huge mountain affects everyone around there and even when Piano was telling me about when she was there, the smell was so horrific, it's become a part of their life, but also just a lot of people just in that community no longer uses sustainable water sources to, to water the vegetables or to, to, to do whatever because they can't. It's, it's so horrific. And when Piano was there also, she followed the water into the ocean and we see toxic waste there as well. So we want to all acknowledge that there's a lot that we don't know now. Like we need to spend more time there. We need to really understand um, and learn from the people who really experience it firsthand what's really going on and hear from them. So uh, clearly all of that trash is not coming from the local community. Um, wh where is, you know, what is the source or the range of the source and why did this, do you know why this became the place that um, they brought all the trash to. <laughs> yeah, um, so two things. The first thing is Chonburi is actually, if you have, you, have anyone been to Thailand, been to Pattaya? It's the, this, the, it's the beach where all the tourists go. And Chon Chonburi was established as an industrial sector to drive the Thai economy. There is part of the development plan that Thailand um, or the or Thai government prioritizes. Um, so there's a lot of industrial waste that's generated from the region itself. But very much like um, the way the trash, trash has been transported from country to country, the, the garbage truck you see driving into this site are from different provinces around the country. It's, and the pure, um, there's a lot of corruption going on because they just want to get rid of it. And so wherever it's cheaper to dump the trash, that's why this happens. Uh. I like the project very much. I like when you are saying that um, that your main character is the mountain itself. Uh, I think it's part of the development where you will have to find out whether the interviews or something will be take more. But I hear you, the smell, I hear the, the mountain, I, I hear a lot of visual and things immersive that interest me personally a lot. Um, 
I see it also a kind of a ticking bomb that is kind of that maybe even with rhythm you can place. Do you have some ideas already about formal aspects that you say, well, maybe that's something we will play with or with sound of editing? I'm just going to explain the piano quickly. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, um, I think the um, for because like we uh, the the center is the mountain, so we think that the point of view is the mountain also, and like um, we can use like the charts like for example like the top um, angle shot to look at the people, some of them, some of kind of that, and also um, um, in the film it um, we will see like the this area um, um, in during the day, during the night, and when it rains. And so it feels like they are um, all, all, all the time with the communities. And also, um, yeah, all, as, um, because I, I would like to, to, to get close to the trash. So um, I, I hope that people can like, like see because it's visual, yeah, and smell, <laughs> or um, I'm, I I will sacrifice myself to like smell it <laughs> for you guys. She has. She has. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think I think that that part that part is um, with the documentary platform is very great to um, to express this um, phenomenon because like you you will be more very like. Um, more of getting m much information about like trash or whatever you know. So I just want you to feel like with visually, and you hear the like the the bird sounds and like the truck um, always like um, processing like um, covering up the. So you so it feels something like that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just wondering because I think. It's earlier mentioned that this is actually a very complex, uh, a complex uh, problem. Are you going to like? I think the visual message will shock us anyway. It's really like uh, closing very, very close to me. If I see that, will you also like a little bit using that as vehicle, visual vehicle, go into this complexity as you mentioned that the trucks are dumped there from somewhere else, the policymakers doesn't seem to care that much, and also the consumption, maybe some, some way to comment on all that kind of aspects, are you going to do something like with all that complex background uh, in your film, or you will just stay with a visual message just to show us how terrible this is? Um, for, for the context background, I think that I will. Um, I think that it would be good to to hear from the local um, to 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 tell us some context information. Also, like the environmental activists who can show us very well about like the the, the context of Thailand right now. And, um, and to to add also that Professor Somnuk has his has done the most research into waste mismanagement in our country and he's been mentoring us on this project um and so with his voice he will be able to give the context and the background and our understanding of what mis what waste mismanagement looks like what it means the methane that you see that it could explode anytime um these information will come from people who have knowledge of it and but we will um take more time to 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 feel to understand and like with the sound, with the the um, what score of the film, so it's, you will feel like the power of <laughs> some invisible power. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that. But it's actually like we are facing in in our country. Yeah, yeah. the feel. Thank you so much for sharing and for pitching. Thank you. Okay, um, thank, thanks to all of our filmmakers for pitching. Can we have another round of applause, please, for our like, brave filmmakers? 
I'm, I'm nervous to say these last two paragraphs that I have to say in front of you all, so uh, the fact that you all got up here is amazing. Um, we host these regional pitches as opportunities to highlight the amazing range of stories uh, in the regions of the world and to galvanize support for all of these projects. Uh, while we only one project will get completion funding, and we have another that's going to get honor, an honorary, uh, an honorable mention, excuse me, but only one is going to get the full uh, cash prize. But many of our films find other partners to finish, uh, and some also come back to us to participate in our distribution mentorship. In past pitches, other projects have been awarded full funding, post-production partnerships, and interest all from other platforms and organizations. Uh, today, we're really, really excited to be joined by Kira Dane and Caitlin Rebelo, uh, the directors of Mizuko, uh, who were the winners of our 2018 American Northeast pitch. Can you guys stand up? Pr they premiered their film at ITFA, here at ITFA, a couple days ago. So uh, along with those lovely filmmakers, um, our finalists and winners are screening at dozens of festivals internationally and have broadcast on PBS's illustrious, amazing shorts platform, POV Shorts, um, where I used to be a producer, and um, as well as Independent Lens and internationally on Al Jazeera and NHK. Uh, they've also streamed internationally on New York Times Opdocs, among and uh, other platforms. Their projects, uh, yeah, uh, among other platforms. We encourage any of those interested in these projects for support or distribution to connect with us at, at TFI and to keep up to date on their progress. Uh, again, you have all of their information and all of our information in the sales books on your sheet on your seats. Uh, while I have the mic and before I let you go, I'd l just love to thank our partners of this pitch for their diligence, talents, and generosity of time and spirit. Uh, thank you so much to Jasper from ITFA and Zena from uh, TFI for their help in the selection process. There you are, Jasper. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks to Sue Kim and Ragan Hildeck um, from IEFTA for lending their expertise to our teams yesterday at our pitch training. Uh, today's work would not be possible without the support of Riot Films. They're not here today, but I'm just gonna extend lots of good vibes uh, towards my friends in the States, Haley Papas and Callie Barlow for their support and involvement. It's such a gift to partner with IDFA. We are so especially grateful to the entire forum team for lending us this stage, particularly Yorinda Siegel, Adriak uh, Van Neuhausen, and Stein Mace Masters, uh, and Peter in the booth for making it look and sound perfect today. And last but certainly not least, our pitch production manager, Nadine, who gave so much time and help and effort and generosity towards making this happen. Uh, lastly, I'm I'm gonna give a special shout out to my partner in crime, Caitlin May Burke, for leading the charge and sending <laughs> countless emails and um, just uh, keeping us on good time so we can all go and get lunch, maybe some pupusas, because I'm hungry now. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, please come tonight to the reception, nine o'clock, uh, and then you'll get the winners, and then we're having a little dance party afterwards, so it'll be fun. Thank you.